And welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is Oakland Creates uh, Black Horror Comics panel and we are discussing the Box of Bones. Thank you for joining us. We have Stacy Robinson with us. We have Aizi Jama Everett, Bill Campbell, and John Jennings with us to discuss the wonderful comic book series. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and let's see. Give me just a second. All right. Huh? So quickly, I'm going to go over just a few housekeeping things. First off, what is Oakland Create? Oakland Create started in 2015 as a way to provide opportunities for black and brown artists to showcase their work in a safe space that not only prioritized African, indigenous, Latino culture, but that celebrates diversity and sought a fair exchange for creativity and artistic exper experimentation. Oakland Creates developed into a mini zine fest, comic fest showcasing zines, art, and comics from new and emerging artists in the East Bay, Oakland area. Primarily giving space to traditionally underrepresented voices, Oakland Creates also gives space to creators who work to build a conscious, uplifting, and holistic community. Just gonna quickly go over the lineup for tonight. I'm gonna uh, talk about safe space policy, then we'll have artist bio, I'll introduce everyone and then we'll jump right into the discussion. Um, so tonight we have, oh, I'm sorry. So Oakland Creates is committed to providing a safe space, an inclusive environment for everyone, regardless of gender, gender identity, expression, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, or religion. We will not tolerate harassment at Oakland Creates events in any form. Anyone violating the safer spaces policy may be sanctioned or expelled from our space, even virtual, meaning on YouTube, on any of the uh, streamings or Zoom calls. And it's at the discretion of any Oakland Creates Art, Comics, and Deep Fest organizer or volunteer as to whether you will be allowed to continue uh, with us. And so, uh, like I said, first up, we have artist and writer, Aizi Jama Everett. Aizi Jama Everett was born in 1974 in Harlem, New York. He has traveled extensively in North, Northern Africa, Northern California. Um, Ox Oxana, Mexico, and he holds three master's de degrees, divinity, psychology, and creative writing, and has worked as a bookseller, professor, and therapist. He has a firm desire to create stories that people want to read. He believes the narratives of our times dictate future realities, and he's invested in working subversive notions like family choice, striving when not chosen to survive, and ir irrational optimism into his creations. Three of his books have been published by Small Beer Press, the Liminal series, with another on the way. He's published a graphic novel with noted artist John Jennings entitled The Box of Bones, which we're going over tonight, and his forthcoming, a forthcoming graphic novel adaptation of The Count of Monte Cristo coming from Abrams Press. And shorter works can be found in The Believer, LA Review of Books, and Race Bader. Stacy Robinson. Stacy Robinson is a visual. Oh, I'm sorry. Stacy Robinson is a visual artist 
and an assistant professor of graphic design and illustration at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and was a 2019-2020 Nasser Jones Hip Hop Fellow. And as a member of the Black Speculative Arts Movement, Stacy has traveled inter internationally having difficult conversations uh, surrounding ideas of Black liberated futures. And as one half of the collaboration of Team Black Kirby with artist John Jennings, he creates graphic novels, gallery exhibitions, lectures, and illustrated syllabi that uh, reimagine re the work of comic book creator Jack Kirby uh, to reimagine resistance spaces inspired by Black diasporic cultures. His latest graphic novel, I Am Alfonso Jones, written, uh, written writer, written by Tony Medina, was published in 2017 from Lee and Lowe Books. And across the tracks, remembering Greenwood, Black Wall Street, and the Tulsa Race Massacre, written by Alvern Ball, and that will be available in 2021. And John Jennings is with us as well. John Jennings is a professor of media and culture studies at the University of California at Riverside. Jennings is the co-editor of the Eisner Award-winning collection, The Black or the Ink, Constructions of Black Identity in Comics and Sequential Art. Jennings is also a 2016 National Jones Hip Hop Studies Fellow with the Hutchins Center at Harvard University. Jennings' current projects include the horror anthology Box of Bones, the coffee table book Black Comics Returns with Damian Duffy, and the Eisner winning Bram Stoker Award winning New York Times best selling graphic novel adaptation of Octavia Butler's classic dark fantasy novel Kindred. Duffy and Jennings recently released their graphic novelization of Octavia Butler's priest dystopian novel Parable of the Sower from Abrams. Jennings is also founder and curator of the Abrams Megascope line of graphic novels. And last but not least, Bill Campbell is the author of Sunshine uh, Patriots, My Booty Novel, and Pop Culture Politics Puns, Pooh Butts from a Liberal Stay-at-Home Dad, and Coontown Killing Caper. Oh, that's along with Edward Austin Hall. He co-edited the groundbreaking anthology Mothership, Tales from the Afrofuturism and Beyond. He co-edited Stories for Chip, a tribute to Samuel R. Delaney with Nisi Shaw. Bill also co-edited Artist Against Police Brutality with Jason Rodriguez and John Jennings with Profits Going to the Innocence Project. His, uh, I'm sorry, his, gra his, his historical graphic novel with Benton, I'm going to destroy this, I'm so sorry, Benton Kotabadan, The Day of the Clan Came to Town, will be released by PM Press in 2021. Campbell lives in Washington, D.C., where he spends his time with his family, helps produce audiobooks for the blind, and helms uh, Rosar Rosarium Publishing. And so I'd like to jump right in and ask uh, the panelists to talk a little bit about the premise of Box of Bones. And this can be answered around Robin uh, to talk about the premise of Box of Bones. I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now. So first on my screen is uh, John, if you want to talk a little bit about the premise of the story and Aizi as well. Sure, 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 sure. Um, so I was actually talking to another friend of ours named uh, Ronaldo Anderson once about um, this, this, this uh, beat poem by um, Amir Baraka and it's called Black Dot and Aizimus. And he was like, you know what? <laughs> this would be a great, uh, inspiration for like a horror story, you know, because essentially it's about like, well, what happens when justice isn't enough or what happens when oppression actually pushes you to the point where, you know, um, you kind of become the monster that society says that black people are, you know, and um, I was kind of bouncing some ideas around. And I think I, I think what happened a few years ago, and it's been, it's been a while now, but it's like, you know, I was talking to Yize. And uh, we wanted to work. We wanted to work on something together, 
and um, it started out being called shadow box to start with. <laughs> and uh, and the user's like, yeah, no, but there's a lot of things called shadow box. And I think I had fairly recently like we've been reintroduced to uh, Henry Dumas's short story, Arc of Bones, right? And I was like, well, what about Box of Bones? You know, and he really liked that one. And he's like, this is the story we want to work on. So we pitched it sometimes as, you know, Afrocentric Hellraiser, but it's a lot more layered than that, of course. But there are some, there are some notions of like cur a cursed object that holds, um, you know, these these monstrosities that oppression have create has created, you know, and uh, to a certain degree, uh, that is like one of the central ideas. Like, well, what happens when justice doesn't occur for Black folk? Where does it go? You know that kind of thing. Sometimes we we laughingly call it like it's it's the Florida it's the Florida uh, Evans you know punch bowl moment in a box. You know, <laughs> um, it's the uh, it's the make me want to holler moment in a box. You know that kind of thing. Like what is the thing that's next? You know, and that's somewhat that's one of the kind of like more effective ideas around it because we can get into more discussions about the the content. But um, you know that's kind of like where it started as a conversation. Are you that you want to pick up? Sure. Um, I think from there, it was kind of like, um, you know, when you think about uh, racial violence in the U.S., um, I'm always surprised that there isn't more, right. you know, I'm always just like fascinated by the fact that like, you know, there, there are so many different oppressed groups in this country, but especially African-Americans um, that were just not, can I swear on this? I'm not sure. Am I yeah, um, <laughs> limit it, but yeah, sure. We're, we're all adults, I hope. <laughs> yeah, like I'm always surprised like we're not blowing shit up all the time. Do you know what I mean? Like it's just fascinating to me. And so I was like, well, why not? You know, it's like it's almost magical. It's almost like um some like dark art that has like um contained the like rage and violence and and um you know like physical resistance to the oppression that goes on for black people. And so um as I was helping to craft the narrative, that's a lot of what was going in my head of like, well, what is it that keeps what keeps the lid on the box? What keeps the lid on, on this violence? And then what would happen if that was let go? You know, it's like a Franz Fanon's sort of wet dream, you know, of just like, if you really want liberation, you have to take your liberation. But what happens with violence, um, like with many things, is that if you contain it for too, for too long, um, it ends up consuming itself. Mm -hmm. And it ends up consuming the people that like had that initial rage at first. So it's not just revenge fantasy, but it's also the, the complexities of what happens when we engage in, uh, you know, when people engage in a psycho-spiritual liberatory praxis that, that doesn't guarantee our own survival. And, I'm sorry. And so one of the things that I talk about in my comic is um, what happens when all hell breaks loose and you've already hit your limit, but I think there's a class sort of difference in the story that I'm telling. I'm dealing with uh, young adults that are in the, the hood uh, or ghetto, as you might say. And so the, the difference, I think you're dealing with the college professor, right? Yep. Um, do you think class uh, mm -hmm. plays a, a role in storytelling in terms of the horror gen genre? And even, in, uh, I know it does in, in our day-to-day -day real life, but when you're writing horror, um, how mm -hmm. does class figure in to the story? Well, so, um, John, I'm gonna start, I'll hand it off to you, is that all right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, you know, one of the things I always think about is, um, you know, um, so black exploitation saved Hollywood at one point. Um, Hollywood was about to go down if it wasn't for um, Shaft and movies like that. Um, and Hollywood began to phase um, the black exploitation film out in favor of the horror film. Right. And the reason they did was because they were like, black people will go to see um, white people get murdered. <laughs> um, mm. White people murdered and black people murdered <laughs> as well. Whereas white people won't go to see black people be heroes. And I mention it just because in terms of film, um, you know, film is supposedly, or movies, not film, movies are sort of like the, the low class entertainment for America. It's supposed to be accessible to everybody. If it can't play in Des Moines, if it can't play at a movie theater in Des Moines, then you're probably not going to get it made by a major studio. So when it comes to class, horror is, I think, at our core, 
in the US, one of the things that it's, it's like a common language that we can all speak on. Um, and in fact, the lower class you are, or the more economically disenfranchised you are, um, the more horror sort of appeals because it mirrors some of the some of the grime that poverty offers, you know, some of the people dying and nobody caring, like there being a predator on the loose and the cops not giving, not caring, right? Like mystical entities could like eat up small children and take them into a little bit and no one's gonna pay attention, you know, like in you know Washington DC in the in the eighties, like that was happening. You know what I mean? So um yeah class has a I think mean, class has a has a strong root in um, in the genre of horror as a whole. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's I, a great, I'm sorry, go ahead, John. No, 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 you go ahead, please. So that's a great segue into my first question really is why graphic novels, um, why tell a story and visually uh, rather than just a traditional n- novel? Um. That's a good question. Well, here's the thing. I mean, when you say traditional, I mean, you know, there's a there's a comics tradition as well. So you mean like a text yes. novel, right? So um, I think that, well, first of all, the level of difficulty, it's very hard to scare people with comics. You know, <laughs> you know that's that's one thing that's really interesting. Even though there's a there's a long and storied past of like horror comics in our in our comics history, you know. Um, from like EC Comics to like the Warren publishing stuff, the stuff from DC Comics and Marvel back in the 70s. Um, we that we have there's a long history of the horror comic, but it's always been very difficult to get across the affect of horror through a comic book because you know, a lot of times, you know, when you reify something on a page, it's hard to um it's hard to beat the, the human imagination. So you have to be really clever with stuff that you create that you come up with. So I think the level of difficulty is one part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is that comics are great. You know, it's a it's a wonderful, complex narrative uh, narrative form. I mean, it's it's it can be the merger of like image and text together. It doesn't necessarily have to be images in sequence that are drawn that way. Um, offers a different sort set of uh, affordances and challenges that I think a lot of different types of prose and writing doesn't. You know, um, and so I think that um, trying to create a narrative that is unsettling, that is visual in that particular way, you know, uh, is, um, is a, it's a really wonderful challenge. And I think it, you know, a, a lot of times, you know, we're kind of basically couching it in the history of, of the horror comic too. But comics as themselves, I mean, are just a phenomenal uh, medium that I feel like right. we're just starting to scratch the surface of in our country, so. So can anyone can answer this. So what experience did you have? What was a horror or a comic book specifically horror though a horror movie or a comic book that struck you or sort of excited you for the first time i think the first time i was terrified was watching halloween the 1978 john carpenter version is there a, a groundbreaking moment where you're like oh my god this is i'm addicted this is wonderful i love horror actually um halloween was uh it for me too even though i, I don't yeah. So basically my mom, some neighbor kids convinced my mom to let me watch Halloween <laughs> way too young. Exactly. Me and too. unfortunately for us, we only lived in a one floor house and I had windows on either side of my bed. <laughs> so for like two weeks, I literally slept under my bed. because I was just like absolutely terrified. Yeah. Awesome. On the comic side, I think, um, just Bernie Ritson's images. Mm-hmm. Like, I just love Bernie Ritson. And then uh, reading wise, probably uh, Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's good. <laughs> that's Anybody good. else want to take this one on? Yeah, I'll jump in. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, sir. All right, cool, cool. Sorry, I had some difficulty a moment ago. I am on my phone now, so hopefully my internet is more stable. Um, for me, I have to jump right into the film. And I think that my, uh, I still go back and forth with this, but I know my three favorites are still um, probably in order. I would go John Carpenter is a Thing, 1982, and then um, Salem's Lot, which I just finished watching again. <laughs> and at 48, I was still horrified. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and and I, I, I would throw The Exorcist in there. Definitely, that's mm. that another one that still just horrifies me. And then um, The First Howling, 
Mm. Yeah. Mm. The, the, the werewolf so scene good, and the, uh, <laughs> say again? What? No, it's just so good. Like yeah. it's, it's it was, a, yeah, 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 yeah. And they the storytelling holds up, and that's the thing with those practical effects. Yeah, practical effects. Um, the great storytelling. It's still, I mean, you know, still great inspirations to me in reference to just good storytelling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the build up and the exorcist, the build up to what's gonna happen to the little girl is just mm-hmm. chilling. Like, whoo. Yeah, 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 yeah. How about you, Easy? You know, it's um, it's funny. Like, um, hearing Stacy's stuff, and just shout out to Stacy for making scary ass images all the time. <laughs> um, like, const- like that thing behind. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> what, nobody. Stacy's head. That's what Stacy thinks about. <laughs> but um. <laughs> You know, for me, like, like all those movies, I love them, but like, they never scared me. I was like, I was into them. I was excited about them, but they didn't like scare me. But there was one comic um, and it's a, it's a Hellblazer comic. And Mm -hmm. it was just, it was, it was just like the the intelligence of the way the panels were laid out. It's basically John Constantine, super badass, whatever, meets a priest who is evil and does bad things. And the priest has heard the devil's confession. And John Constantine is like talking to this guy, and I think it's um, Glenn Fabry. No, it wasn't Glenn Fabry. It was Steve Dillon who did the mm-hmm. um, interior art, and it's very realistic. And he says, "Okay, I just want to know, um, you know." So John Constantine's like, "Okay, so what was the devil's confession?" And then the panel just goes to John Constantine, and it's in text, and he just goes, "That's when he pulled out two pencils, stabbed himself in the eyes, and headbutted the pew in front of him." And I literally oh. threw the comic away. I was like, oh. <laughs> you know what I mean? So for me, it's always about like what's not seen. Right. Like as soon as I see the monster, I'm like, I know how they did that. That's latex with some fur on top of it and some jelly. You know what I mean? Or like that girl's like a, you know, she's a contortionist and that's, you know, split pea soup. You know what I mean? Like that, that part doesn't get me. It's when you leave it to the imagination and you leave just, like you give just enough and then you you leave out enough that I'm like, okay, now I'm gonna be awake on that for like a month and a half. Thank you very much, I hate you. <laughs> That's funny. No, I, I, I was thinking, um, even though even though this movie does not hold up, but at the time when I was a child, it was like traumatizing to me, uh, was Phantasm, you know? It, it actually mm. gets like the second one is actually much better, you know, because you can tell it's almost like what they did with like Evil Dead and Evil Dead mm. Two. Where it's like let's remake this movie, but with, with more, I think, <laughs> you know, and um, yeah, because you know, I, my my mom was a huge fan of horror. Actually, I started reading. I think the first things I probably read were like horror books, like Stephen King and like you know um, Clive Barker, like stuff I really shouldn't have been reading super early, you know, and even like and a lot of gothic stuff like Nathaniel Hawthorne stuff and like Poe you know, right. at an early age. And uh, my mom was always really into all the really inappropriate stuff. <laughs> like, and we would watch it together, you know? <laughs> so um, yeah, and talk about it. I mean, I grew up in grind houses, you know what I'm saying? Like we had this one uh, theater called Cinema West 1 and 2, and we would go in in the morning and then would leave and it'd be like another day almost. You spend like $2 wow. and you see like three or four horror movies or Bruce Lee movies or whatever. And that's, and my mom loved that stuff, you know? And so, you know, we, we grew up, I mean, I grew up with, with that kind of, um, that was the impression. I, I, I have this theory that whatever you're like watching or reading at, at age 11 or 12, that, that sticks with you for the rest of your life. That's, that is, if it's My Little Pony, then you are, you are, you are My Little Pony, <laughs> really? love it forever. Whatever's 11 and 12 up in there, that's, that's your thing. You know, for me, it was like Doctor Who and like horror comics and stuff. So, um, the fan- phantasm, though, is like I understood werewolves. I understood how to kill a werewolf. That's Silver Bullet. You got some Wolf Bane. You know, he, Dracula. I got. You'll say, okay, he's scary, but I can if I got a, you know, if I got a, a piece of wood or like a cross or something, I might be able to deal with that. I didn't understand the mythology of phantasm. I didn't understand it. I was like, what is this thing with the silver ball? I don't understand what's happening. Why is he saying boy like that? I don't know. It was just, <laughs> it was just like messed up to me and it was the first time i didn't realize that they were going to make sequels to it so to me like the end of phantasm was the end and you know what happens at the end the first phantasm yeah. as, as the tall man grabs the protagonist who was the little white boy through a window and i'm yeah. like well if they don't care about a little white boy then they definitely not gonna care about me <laughs> 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 
And like, and then he's gone. I'm like, yo, that's the end? I'm like, where's the rest of it? It's like, I'm shaking the screen. Like, hello? Is there more in there? No, it's no. And that terrified me. I was like, yo. So it was like, when you, when you start, you know, you start killing kids on screen like that, or whatever was going to happen to him, it could have been worse. And I couldn't sleep, you know? Oh. The other thing was like Night Stalker. Oh, that was, was a big huge, one. Huge, even though, you know, it's a huge influence. And as far as like comics, uh, like Bill, Bernie Wrightson's work, um, I read everything from uh, from DC Comics, like Ghosts and Doctor Thirteen, and like Tales and Unexpected, House of Secrets, House of Mystery, blah blah blah, all of it. And even like the just, even like the spinoff stuff from Charlton Comics, like you know Grim Ghost Stories, and like you know all those all those weird little like uh, characters that are all that are all connected to EC Comics, right? And then of course the Warren books from the 1970s, the, the black and white Warren, like creepy, eerie, all that stuff. So I was just an addict for a long time. I'm still dealing with that, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> I'm still dealing with that addiction. <laughs> so I, I, I forgot one. I just wanted to do a quick shout out to uh, Wolfen. Oh, oh yeah, that's Wolfen. a good one. You know what, Wolfen's underrated, man. You know, it's, I know. It's a, that's a good heart, that's a good. And it's got Gregory heart. Hines and Edward James almost. Word. Oh, word. <laughs> and an almost that's sober that's Albert Finney. I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> Wolfen and the Howling is all like ethnic werewolves in the hood. That's right. That, that's right. You know, and, and, and I, you know, another one that reminds me of that fairly recently is Where. You ever seen Where? W E R? Because it yes. kind of picks up on that that idea of cool. the the ethnic werewolf to a certain degree. That, that's is, on that's on my list to watch. I just saw it the, so on the uh, Prime. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, um, we have a couple people in the chat on YouTube saying uh, Nisbet, uh, Junji Ito. Junji Ito. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you guys, uh, you into that or? Oh yeah, I'm not I'm sure. I got one of his books up in here. Like, cause uh, you're talking about uh, Spiral. I don't, I don't read like. Don't, a don't I'm please. Usaki. There's me. <laughs> no. It's hard. See, that's what I'm saying. It's hard to scare the hell out of somebody, and you just see the thing is. The J horror crate, like you didn't understand what their what their horror language is, you know what I'm saying? Right. So when it when so when you get movies like you know, um, The Grudge and you know well you know Juwan or whatever, we don't understand their vernacular around what how, what they what scares them. So not only is it like you know this 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 uh, cultural discourse, but then it's like the imagery, you know, the imagery exactly. And so yeah, Spiral is mm-hmm. messed up, and so is uh, the one with the fish with the mutated fish. I forgot the name of that one. Mm-hmm. That's messed well, up. I've never watched the <laughs> audition, but I heard the audition is really yeah it's too much. Yeah, I don't want to mess with that. Actually, too, <laughs> so the, the the thing in the audition was kind of an inspiration for um <clears throat> one of our monsters. Huh. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, do you consider the work Afro futuristic or black spe- speculative or just 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 general horror? That is a good question. You know, I have to I have to admit, I don't, you know, when when Afrofuturism as a term came back into, you know, me into into the mainstream culture or whatever, you know, I, I did notice that people were like couching everything that was spe- black and speculative <laughs> under it, you know? Right, right. So yeah, so I, I, I don't, you know, I don't like the idea of like doing away with genre because cause horror is a it, it does particular types of work, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's why I came up with the idea of the, the ethnogothic, you know. So I think like, you know, the ethnogothic or these types of like black horror things, they unpack trauma or to unpack, unpack the horror so we can get to the Afro future. Because these days I think Afrofuturism is more of a destination than, you know, than anything. Um, that's just me though. I, I feel like it's different. <laughs> so when we talk about black past and black futures, but you know, I feel like it's something else to me, but. Well, that was, I mean, I think even from its origin, like Afrofuturist was n- was never that specifically de- defined. I mean, I know there's like a, a definition, but at a, like B, I was on one of those those early listservs. Right, in the 90s. Yeah, in the 90s. And it was like, you know, it wasn't like everybody on there was writing about Black people in the future specifically. Right. You know what I mean? It was just a place for Black people to have the freedom to imagine fill in the blank. Mm-hmm. Right. And because publishing at that time, you know, media at that time couldn't imagine Black people doing much other than imagining, you know, woeful 
you know, post-slavery Negro tales of suffering and 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 depression and right that like it was like oh if you imagine like if you imagine a happy black family like forty years from now you're like oh that's Afrofuturism you're like no nah, right. bro uh, no, no that's just that's science fiction definitely <laughs> <laughs> I was like I mean but to be honest it was like I like I'll take the label because I was like you know, like the people that were in there, the people that were doing that work were st are still doing work. That's right. Like DDC, Deep Dick Collective, like Pomo Afro Homos, right? Like black radical queer hip hop. Yep. Are we seeing that now? Cause yeah. that was Afrofuturist, right? Like right. Um, Nalo Hopkinson, right? Like she was in there. Like is that, uh, she Afrofuturist? Sure. She seems to write about uh, Caribbean fantasy a lot more than she does about, you know, future, but whatever. But she was in there. Right? right, DJ Spooky. DJ Spooky is just making awesome music. Yeah. Okay, like if you want to call it that, that's fine. Like I would say, if you're gonna call Box of Bones after Futurist, then you'd have to call Lovecraft Country after Futurist. Right. You'd have to call like the Ballad of Black Tom from um, Tom Avow after Futurist. Um, so it's like. You know, maybe it's a better question for Bill because Bill's the publishing. Yeah, man. no, exactly. Don't <laughs> like, no, <laughs> no, 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 question like these okay, buzzwords, right, just marketing so, buzzwords. Okay, so like, like, well, I mean, we're all generally the same age, so you know, we all got hit with the whole Afrofuturism thing, what, like eight years ago, and we were all like, wait, what? Because you know, first we were told for like the last twenty years that we didn't exist. <laughs> and then like all of a sudden it's like oh no you exist and you're part of this thing and you're like wait what, what? right um, <laughs> and just because of you know my own creative and my own just sort of artistic interests I don't get into labels so much because you know codifying things kill it yeah um and also it just doesn't really I prefer life on the margins um probably not financially but uh <laughs> just in general <laughs> um but I was recently having to explain what Afrofuturism was to somebody for business purposes. And just on a lark, I said that, you know, basically think of it as, you know, artist in a constant dialogue with the past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, wow, for some BS, that doesn't sound too bad. <laughs> so, like, if you want to take Afrofuturism, as, as I easily said, I mean, it's pretty much a catch-all. I and, mean, you know, I mean, and, and it still can be. I mean, it can, you know, affect literature, visual arts, social activism, all this stuff. So then I really do think of it as sort of like this dialogue that you have with this continuum of Blackness, I guess, that spans just ages, times, uh, continents, physical space, and any other kind of thing that you wanted to do mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but maybe that's just utilitarian on my part because that's just the way i view what i'm doing <laughs> so. and you want to stay away from labels for sure you know well, self it's a, it, i'm sorry it's a what is it it's classify commodify codify kill mm. and yeah the, the whole idea of self-segregation is kind of ridiculous especially when you're in the communication or visual arts business to share with everybody and share universal themes that everybody can resonate with. But I had to ask because I keep hearing it over and over. So right. I, mean, I was in defense of it. I'll say this much when you are learning to create or when you are generating the art, sometimes it's good to have an audience that is familiar with your references. And in that sense, like if somebody's like, oh, I'm big into Afrofuturism, then I'm like, okay, cool. You can be a beta reader. Like you, like, you're not going to be like, so, you know, why are the black people so angry in this? It's like, oh, bruh. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to have to explain that stuff. Right. Like I want, like, there's, there's a base that we can launch from. Mm -hmm. um, and that way it can be useful. And then yes, in other ways, it's totally pigeonholing and a pain in the butt, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I go both ways. I mean, you know, it's, uh, you know, cause I teach three classes on Afrofuturism, <laughs> you know. One is on visual culture, one is on horror, and one is on uh, black, black superheroes, you know. And um, I think a lot of this too is like, you know, I try to destabilize the idea as much, you know, as much as I can, but also there's, um, 
there is something to be, be talked about, you know, in, I'm in the academy. So of course, that's what we do with Bill is talking about. We codify things, we define things. It gives you a starting point, you know, it gives you a reference point. Uh, but that doesn't, that doesn't state that it has to be, you know, that at the end of it, you know. I think a lot of it's about affect too, you know. Like for instance, with Box of Bones, we're trying to make you feel uncomfortable <laughs> about these issues, you know. So that to me, that discomfort is, can be horrific. So it, you know, someone says it's Afrofuturist horror, fine, you know. I refer to myself as an Afro speculative artist these days because I can make something that's really light and joyous and futuristic, but also something that would keep you up at night, you know. <laughs> so, wow. you know, so yeah, I think it's um, it's just a, pl a place to start. I don't know if it's necessarily a, uh, it's useful for, for you know, it's good to, pe to for, for things to have a, a space to go on the shelf. You know, that's that's not bad. You know, so. And so, can you talk a little bit about? the creatures um or um if you if you want to share some images of and explain all the or is that giving away too much no no no, no it's not, talk yeah. about all of the different creatures that are in the box i'm gonna go through this really quickly because i want to talk to i like talking to y'all more than showing this stuff so i'm gonna let's see here okay can y'all see that Yep. All right, cool. Yeah. So this is Lindsay Ford. This is she's not a professor. Uh, she's a graduate student, and actually, she's at Berkeley. <laughs> she's at UC Berkeley, and she's <laughs> a um, she's a um, a, a graduate student who's working on her PhD in like African American studies, but you know with a focus on like folklore and, and things of that nature, right? And so the box comes. She comes across the box in her childhood. You know, uh, her, her, her grandfather, who's a blind blues man, tells her about this box. And then she she dismisses it as kind of like a spook story. And then she realizes, wait a minute, when she starts her research, she starts to realize that this particular, this box pops up throughout history in different parts of diaspora, you know. So this is like uh, some early images of her. Um, these are the wonderful covers for um, the rest of the series. You only seen like a- <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Stacy did. Thought you got to feel your own shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, they really don't. That's the thing. They really don't. don't even. Yeah, don't even notice that the first one is is uh, is missing the bow. And, and when we did that one, he was like, something is missing from that particular. And, he, and, he, and we put the bow on there, and and I sent it to Tanarive Du, and she said that that is wrong. That you should not have put that bow in there because it terrified. <laughs> that was the thing, right? Anyway, so is these that are, a is that a reference to Beloved, Stacy? The bow, the book, beloved, that bow. No, no, it was, it was, it's directly related to this character from the story. Because you remember the red, it's not red, but the red ribbon that's floating down the river in beloved. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. they probably should be that, huh? Yeah, of course, it's a reference to that. Stop that. <laughs> <laughs> now it is. <laughs> anyway, we have some pages from uh, the beginnings of the of the. Which happened, which actually happened on a slave ship. This, this is actually by um, Barrington Edwards. Some of these drawings, which we still have to uh, finish up. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, he's really talented. So anyway, so really quickly, the suffering. The suffering is really inspired by this character from um, I wasn't in a video game. Shoot, uh, the character is called Red Pyramid. You familiar with? This? Yeah, um, just Silence. Oh, silence oh my. Silent Hill, yeah. yeah. When I saw Silent, the, I don't play video games, but I saw the character on the Silent Hill movie, and I was like, "What is that? And how can I do something with that?" You know, because basically the suffering is essentially like a, it's it's it, it deals with the stereotype of the of the black brute or the black you know violent black man, you know, and pushes it to the limit, you know. So almost think of like a really really scary version of like John Henry, and so we we actually wanted to kind of like dial into the minstrel aspects of it you know we've actually postulated about what's under his hat too it's probably like some kind of wild creature up under there too we haven't really figured that out yet i don't know if we need, necessarily need to know but the idea is um you know this character represents the violence hyper hypersexuality hyper you know whatever uh, that's heaped upon like you know the black male body and that's what the suffering represents um here's some different renditions of that character and when we were designing these back and forth, we were just thinking like, well, you know, we wanted to create characters that 
seemed familiar, but also um, had a sense of uh, uncanniness because of the fact that they're coming directly from you know the black experience. You know, so like the whaling, for instance, is uh, is a newer uh, beastie. She represents um, the 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 plight of, of of mothers who've lost their sons to police violence, for instance. You know, and the um, she speaks to a church fan, so I'm almost like a like a spooky church lady character, right? And so her scream like freezes your, your you know, your, your, um, your bones and she speaks to the church fan, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, the Night Doctor, uh, which is like the first of the, of the characters that are, is created in America, it represents like um, uh, medical apartheid, you know. Basically the Night Doctor uh, was an actual story that would be told to slaves to kind of keep them from running off you know, the needle man's gonna get you or the night yeah, doctor's gonna get no, you. And it's a real thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> like from Baylor, Baylor University and a whole bunch of other universities in the South have finally admitted that from like the 1890s to the 1960s, they were doing experimentations on black people and not telling them what they were doing. Right. So all those mm. legends that we had about like night doctors in the South, like they were actually real. Right. Yes. I think a lot of those, uh, a lot of those skeletons that they use in medical school. I mean, those those are us, right? <laughs> those are us. That's uh, those are us. all messed up, man. See, and the thing oh, is, the night doctor, high. the night doctor also represents like you know uh, all the different types of experiments done on black people across generations, and so we wanted to actually have him look like a medical doctor, but also kind of a plague doctor, but also he looks like a crow, you know, cause you know, he's referring to like Jim Crow and that kind of thing too. So it's just a, cre again, it's like, it's, it's taking these different familiar ideas and like kind of merging them together. Even even like his um, his smock is like a kind of a de demonic red cross symbol. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's kind of what it is, you know? And these are some other um, implications of that character. Uh, the dark, the dark is kind of like if you want to compare it to um, to uh, Hellraiser, then the dark is kind of like our pinhead character a little bit. You know, he he kind of keeps the rest of the beasties in line to a certain degree. Um, when when I was actually the dark is the first is the first. Um, this is actually the first drawing of the dark. Actually, now I think about it, this is the first drawing. At first, it was just going to be the dark in the box, and then me and Ayuse started creating other beasties <laughs> before we knew it. And um, as you can see, he's the mask that he wears is very much influenced by like the captured slave mask and stuff. So this is actually like a, the design that they would use for slaves who've run away and then they've been recaptured. Um, we wanted him to be kind of like a like a dark, scary like manservant, uh, almost like a like a like a scary butler character. And then when we were thinking about what the bottom part of him would look like, you know, we kind of just you know throwing ideas around. And I was like, oh, I know what he'll have crow's feet. That'll be scary. And then what we realized uh, later on is found this image of like Burt Williams in a uh, in a crow outfit, like a chicken outfit actually. And I was like, what? So even then, we must have been channeling some some crazy stuff, right? So if you can see some more of these uh, contraptions that were like you know used on slaves, the burden. Totally, this is actually the one that actually is kind of inspired by audition, but also. This particular thing represents uh, the fungibility of slave bodies during like slavery, you know. So it's what it does. It kind of inches around like a like a. It's the one that scares me the most, actually. Uh, it, it's a giant cotton sack, like a long cotton sack, and it's just filled with like slave parts. And and it always needs to to eat. It re it replaces the parts by snatching off limbs. And um, essentially, it's just a long, a long cotton sack, like like the ones that sharecroppers and slaves would wear. I mean, what, what you say. And then of course, the wretched. Let's see, what is what can be more terrifying than a sentient lynching tree? <laughs> so like, That'll turn you into a jigaboo. I mean, exactly, that will turn you into, and, and, and I was like, okay, I think, yeah, because the Jesus, yeah, it should drag you into the tree. And as you're being dragged into a tree, you become a, you become a stereotype, you know, you become a jigaboo or like a piccadilly or whatever. And so the wretched, of course, gets its name from the wretched of the earth by Franz Fanon, right? But the, this actually is di is directly influenced by Beloved, Amy, because remember that 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 um that passage from Beloved where she talks about um the the uh, the, the the blood from from the from the white monk from the, from the monkey's teeth, you know that whole thing about like um, the jungle being implanted in black people by white people, you know, mm -hmm. remember that that quote? Yeah, so that's kind of like where it comes from. 
um, that the jungle in, was inside of themselves, and and the you know the 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 the, the monkey character was them, you know that kind of idea. And so basically, it pretends to be like a regular tree, and then you know it uproots itself. It has this monkey at the end of it. It's yeah, it's totally messed up. On them. it's so, terrifying. Yeah, it's not. It's there's a lot of not right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, the mule represents like the, is the ghost of reparations. You know. Uh, because we never got that mule from forty from the forty acres in the mule joint, and then also the nobody, which we get the name from nobody knows. So that's kind of like the commodification of like black culture. Um, it has whips and chains for hair, and what happens is like it's like a big giant bobblehead. It jumps on top of your head like a mask, and it can control your body. And then once it takes your head, you know, <laughs> actually, yeah, yeah, it just goes somewhere else. Oh. The other thing too is like, you know, a user was like, and it should spit fire. And I was like, but why? <laughs> no, it should spit fire. I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> so, th so those are the, uh, we can go back to those if we want to, but, but those are the, uh, the main incredible. creatures that are in the box. But as you can see, like, this ain't, this ain't Blackula or like Black Werewolf. This is actually like, you know, no, no shade on Blackula though. I'm just saying that this is um, creatures that were created directly from like various types of trauma you know, throughout history, you know, that have made these things, so. Wow, I just pictured the nobody singing that as, that's the last thing you hear as he's killing you. It's right. Like nobody knows. No, yeah, yeah, it's so, yeah, it's so messed up. Yeah, the, the <laughs> So awesome at the same time, though. I mean, we wanted to make creatures that people hadn't really seen before, but but, but felt like you had. You know, and I think that we, with those, uh, with those characters that, that we designed, um, yeah, I think it works out. And uh, the picking any tree is just beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> it just cracks me up on that. I was just reading that just before we started, and I was just like, loving it again, all over again. Was it talking about chapter two? Yeah, that's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay, so. I, I know I got problems because I just love it so much. Like I, I, I mean, that. I mean, I can tell that. Yeah, because. There, in, in chapter two, like there's a lot of picking any speak, you know. <laughs> I wrote it. I wrote it. It's not anybody else's fault but mine. I oh my Lord, have mercy. We're gonna get in so much trouble with this book. <laughs> <And> I <was laughs> like, but I, I pictured them hiding behind the branches, like gleefully giggling as they plot to kill you. And right, because they they're connected to the tree, and and so what happens is they jump out of the tree, and and but the rope never comes off their neck, but they can actually attack you, and so they always in they they're stuck in the tree, and uh, you know that's the nature of stereotypes. It's about fixity. It's just this really, mm, it's an uncomfortable metaphor. <laughs> it's yeah. Just, it's, you know, even, I think they even say like you know we sick boss. You know, <laughs> I'm like that kind of stuff. Like, oh. Oh. Yeah, I did that. I did that. So <laughs> oh my gosh no uh so a question for mostly for uh bill and uh well also everybody who because you all teach right so how do you <clears throat> balance between your your art practice and teaching and even your nine to five and, and family life how, how do you make that work Whew. What I wonder what what is a nine to five? I know I was like, what is that? What, what is, <laughs> that's a, that sound like Afrofuturism. <laughs> nine to five. That's it. <laughs> Where I get Once upon a time in the fairyland. Charlie Parton back in the day. Right, right. It's <laughs> oh, a good movie too. It's a good movie. <laughs> good song. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, you know that I remember reading that question when you sent it to us. That's interesting. The, um, I, I think for me, first of all, I think I, I'm always trying to find, I'm always trying to find ways of working faster. Mm -hmm. uh, thank God for the iPad Pro and Procreate because I'm 100% digital right now, which means I can take my iPad anywhere and I, I can get work done, which is, that's really helped to, um, to, I think I'm working at probably a third of what I used to, what I used to work. Um, but still, I don't feel like it's fast enough and, and balancing that, um, uh, between the, the teaching and, and, um, you know, when you teach, there's also departmental 
uh, university service that you're always performing and letters of recommendation, all types of invisible work that nobody else ever sees, right? That you get very little props for them. Um, but it's the reward is in seeing, you, you know, your students do these amazing things and you help them get there. Um, but that life in a particular way also, speaking just for myself, allows me to be able to draw comics. It allows me to be able to kind of be a multifaceted scholar where I can, oh, I study comic books for a living. I make comic books for a living, but I teach graphic design and illustration for a living. Um, and, and that allows me to be able to afford to do some of these other things that I wanna to do too. Right, so it is always a balance of those things. And I don't think I've ever, I don't, I've never mastered it. I'm always grappling with, with mastering that and um, to the effect where sometimes it affects my health. Like I'm not in a gym like I should and I can feel it. I can feel being at the computer 16 hours a day because you have this deadline, right? Um, I don't know if that answers the questions at all. <laughs> it totally like, answers it. Yeah. I struggle yeah. with the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like, yeah. but I, I also feel like that's the service. Um, and John and I constantly talk about this, debate this, discuss this, and et cetera. Um, it's really hard to say no to a lot of this work because it is, I think John and I do it so well, right? I think that we are able to, kind of, and, and when I say that, right, it, I mean that, we know how to dive into the dark and, and pull that out in these ways that allow our people to express this anger, this frustrating, this frustration. So like, like I usually said, I usually said um, you know, we don't have to explain, well, you know, why are black people so angry in this book? <laughs> well, right? I think we, we do a good job of illustrating that frustration and anger, but in a particular way, it's also how we, you know, this how we exercise this frustration this anger, because I, I promise you, I have thought of ways of doing some very horrible things to people. And, I've, and I was like, you know, I should probably just draw this. <laughs> I should probably just, just write about this and draw this thing um, and, not, and not spend the rest of my life, you know, locked away somewhere or, you know, or away from my family or, or something worse, seriously. Um, no, I've, I've I experienced know. the same thing. I mean, there yeah. may or may not be coworkers killed by zombies in my comic book <laughs> it's a, it is what it is right because those zombies are metaphors right <laughs> <laughs> but i'm also gleefully you know cathartically getting that rage out on yeah. paper yeah it feels good so that hit me so that part what you just said there that hit me in my first summer of grad school where um you know i was working on a book and I was watching horror movies in a cafe all summer. My rent was paid and I'm like, I'm drawing comics. And I'm like, oh my God, this feels so good watching these horror movies. Why do I feel good about, about these white people dying? Why do I feel good? <laughs> it's like, yes, yes. Yeah. Because then I realized, I'm like, yo, sometimes horror is one of the only genres where sometimes black people get justice, right? Like I empathize with the ghosts that tell them, you know, get out. You, you know, this is our home. <laughs> like, yeah, tell them, tell them. But they're like, no, we're gonna, we bought this home. We're going to reconcile our family and all that. And go get them. Right? Go get them. Right? And I'm like, yeah, I understand that. That feel oh. like me right there. Um, I'm sorry. I'm done. That was, that was funny. Like, yeah. no, this, That's awesome. Oh, my God. I got amped. <laughs> Anybody else want to take that on? Delete that part in the edits. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's live, though, dude. You just said that. It's live, you. buddy. Is it the work-life <laughs> balance? Live, not memorance. <laughs> yeah, the work, the work life balance thing, bro. Yeah, yeah. Um, I decided to just give up that whole idea. Right. Um, you know, because it's like day job. You know, I publish, have family, and you know, last year I started writing again. So basically, you just kind of juggle knowing that you're going to drop balls every once in a while and you just kind of keep going and that you hope you just kind of juggle well enough that people don't notice that you're losing your fucking mind <laughs> um wait that was supposed to be funny 
<laughs> you're like, no, no. You're like, no, I'm losing my mind. No, losing really. Mind. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, it was really funny because when uh, Nisi and I did stories for Chip, we had Ron Ryder go, Ryder hit me up and go, uh, I need like, a, I think like a three week, three week extension. And I was like, dude, we haven't even like hit like a call for submissions yet. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I, like we haven't even set like a deadline let alone anything and and i thought it was funny at the time but now i kind of get it like you just yeah. like okay like for me for writing it's like okay in february and march i'm going to write something like i'm going to make my schedule so i can write something then you just kind of hope that you can stick to whatever it is that you're doing as best as you can yeah, and then maybe hit the power ball, and you can just kind of chuck it all. I guess that sounds like a plan. I don't know. I mean, I have a toddler right now, so <laughs> so there is no. It is. It's. I'll ask him what he thinks about balance. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's why I was late for. That's why I was a little late for the panel because you know I was I was you know baby wrangling. So I was. Um. Yeah, it's a lot of hats. I, don't, I need to grow a couple more heads, you know, like the, the 1970s black exploitation movie, right? What's the name of it? The thing with two heads. With two heads, yeah. With yeah, two heads. More heads, you know, to kind of like wear the hats <clears throat> because, you know, I'm also an editor and a professor and, you know, a consultant on a lot of different things. And as Stacy was saying, I mean, there's a lot of, like you said, invisible labor that happens. Um, it looks like I'm become like, uh, um, undergraduate advisor for my department this year too. Mm. I'm like, oh, <laughs> so it's going to be, it's, it's crazy. And then of course, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. I don't know if you noticed, it's crazy. So it's like, nope, you know, there's, like, <laughs> there's a lot going on. And um, I do think that I'm coming back online. You know, there's been a lot of tragedy and craziness jumping off, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I always say that balance isn't static. Your balance, balance is about, you know, moving like, you know, I've said this a million times. Whenever you see someone on a on a tightrope, you know, trying to stop from falling to their death, there's a lot of motion. You know, they're always moving. You know, so it's you're always making adjustments. So, you know, if you're moving and you're making adjustments, I think you're doing okay. <laughs> so, all right, all right. Yeah. so also, go ahead. No, no, go for it. I don't have anything so new to say. <laughs> you talked a little bit, Stacy, about. Uh, working digitally, and that was a question I had. Um, I'd like to work traditionally, but you know, we're forced to learn how to work digitally. Is there a preference? Is there a reason why you work in one or both media with the even just writing on a computer versus longhand on a legal pad? Yeah, you know, I'm not one of those people that, that's a purist. You know what I mean? Like the microwave is a technology, right? Um, now, I, I think that the stove, the oven it cooks much better, actually, <laughs> you know, someone who cooks, you know, um, the computer is a technology, right? So I, I'm not, I'm not really a purist. I, 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 I do miss pencil. I will say I miss pencil. I miss graphite. I miss the sensual nature of traditional medium, right? However, I am also trained as a graphic designer. And um, as a graphic designer, as an illustrator, I'm gonna quote my, my homeboy, um, uh, uh, Charlie Gobill, Charlie Fab Gobill. And when he would, you know, he says, as, as illustrators, we're hired assassins. You know, our job is to, to kill that project. Right, so just like like if you what was that movie uh, was a killer or uh, that Chow Yun Fat? Uh, he's like you get one point five million or whatever. He's like you know money is no object, right? It's like, okay, <laughs> right? So you hire right. If I'm hired to kill this project, all I have to do is save them in in the right format for for the publisher, right? The for the printer, nobody cares if I'm working traditionally or digitally. When they have edits, they need them to be done quickly. So the, the more skill sets I have as an assassin, the better, right? I'm not, I've not mastered the killing yet, but in this particular sense, the iPad Pro has allowed me to work at probably a third of the speed 
um, that I was able to work at before. But, you know, if, if I don't have the iPad, then I have to go back to, to the Wacom tablet. Like I said, nobody cares. So if my job is to, to kill that particular person, right? Now, if, if I got to do it at, I don't know, I don't know the range of a rifle, right? But if, uh, no, if, if I'm skilled with a rifle, I have a, a chance of doing that at long range. But if I miss, then now my enemy is aware and I got to be really dope with the close combat. So if I know how to fight with a knife, that's dope. But what if I'm disarmed? Then I might, I got to be dope with the hands, right? <laughs> right? So, or grappling could be really good, right? So, you know, um, the more skill sets you have, the better you can kill that particular project. So I'm not necessarily a purist. I'm also an emerging DJ. So yes, I spend vinyl. And some people say, oh, you're not DJing unless you use vinyl. That's some BS. Because let me tell you, I'm not, if I ever had to travel to do a really dope dream gig, there's no <laughs> way in the world I'm trying to bring like 50 crates of records, right? Uh, I, I will bring a hard drive and my computer and, and some dope Serato and, and a DDJ, <laughs> right? That fits on my back as a carry-on, you know? And guess what? When it's dope, nobody cares. Nobody cares. All they care about is the dope set. Gotcha. Right. So I don't know. I hope, I hope that answers it. Kind of a long story. <laughs> no, because it's, it's, you know, I think a lot of people uh, will be like, well, 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 working digitally is cheating. I'm like, right. And what game are you playing? Because I'm playing, I got right. a game deadline. Game. Get this I don't know done. what game you know, I only I'm not going back to to using traditional media. I got too many projects. Dude. I got too many things going. I don't miss the smell of it. I mean, I'll, I'll crack open the books. Oh, man, I can smell the ink. I get it. I design books. I love that idea. But, you know, like you're saying, uh, Stacey, a book is also a type of technology. So, mm -hmm. you know, my wife is not going to let me buy another comic book. <laughs> physically, OK. She can buy as many shoes as she wants to. I, you know, right. <laughs> but I can't buy no more books, so I have right. to, I have to buy digital things. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have to create digital things. Mm -hmm. So no, I mean, I'm 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 about like, yo, we need to get this project in. Um, we need to do a lot of different iterations really quickly. Um, as you're stating, no one's gonna care. We wouldn't have finished I'm Alfonso Jones if I was if we were doing that. Um, you know, that deadline for this book that me and Stacy worked on. Wouldn't, wouldn't happen without the iPad, you know? Uh, yeah, none of the stuff I'm doing now is gonna be done that way anymore. I think the la actually the last physical images that I've done was for chapter one of Box of Bones. That's the last, yes. that's it. You know, that says no more. I probably not, you know, I, but I, I definitely, I'm trained um, classically, you know, as a drawer, I have a minor in drawing and, you know, but like Stacy, I'm also a graph designer and so I'm thinking, all right, well, how can we make something really quickly to get it to market, you know, because there is an aspect of that, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to put out books, you know, and get paid too, I, and we want people to see them, you know, <laughs> so, you know, right, right. You know. if I work with iPad and Procreate and Apple Pencil, and, uh, yep, yeah. and that's, that's, that's what I do, my studio goes with me everywhere I go. The last time. book we, John, that last book we just that we just finished up. That was like what fifty pages in like a month and a half to two months. From from uh, yeah, it, it was uh, it was crazy. Like the turnaround was insane. So mm -hmm. yeah, Apple, Apple uh, or Surface. You have a preference? I mean, I've been working with, with I've been working with Mac products my whole career, so it's only it's like to me it's like a different dialect, you know. So I I just don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, Mac same. for me because that's what I was trained on. Yeah, same for me. And yeah. Bill and Naizy, are you guys typing into the computer? Or are you writing longhand? I've oh, always written longhand. Um, I wrote my first novel, uh, Sunshine Patriots. I wrote it like um, two, three week stints, and that was typing. And um, by the time I was done typing it, totally. Um, yeah, I type too fast. Like I used to type about 105 words a minute. So every thought that I had went on the page. And I was like, well, that's absolutely ridiculous. So like Sunshine Patriots, the first draft is like 200 pages longer than the, the final ver ver version of it. So ever since then, I uh, just wrote long, I write longhand, everything, novels, scripts, whatever. 
because um, if it's not worth writing down, then it's not worth reading. Mm. Yeah. You know, I, I remember taking a class with uh, Nettie Okorafor when I was in grad school. And I remember I, at that time I was, um... oh, Bill, did I cut you off? I'm sorry, were you done? Oh yeah, 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 I even took a nap. Don't worry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. I remember, you, I remember at that time I was writing in my notes on my computer, like writing in notes. Should have been writing at least in Microsoft Word. I was writing in, in notes. And I remember doing something really stupid. It's like, oh, I'm going to try to condense my notes and save them and everything. And I somehow deleted oh, I my that. notes. And you remember that story, John? Oh, I, oh, I was yeah. so hurt. I mean, I had so many dope stories and and ideas in there and I deleted it. And I remember, I don't know, I, did, I don't know if I told Nettie about this or something. I just remember her saying, somehow we had talked about this. It might've been a class discussion or whatever. And she talked about how she writes everything like longhand. Yep. And I was like, that makes total sense. You have them in composition books or whatever. You can edit it so much easier. Once you write it out, you can cross out stuff, make notes above it, all of that stuff. And that was a very hard lesson. <laughs> it was a very, very hard lesson. <laughs> I'm still trying to remember. It's like, oh, what was that story? Yeah. Ooh, good segue into uh, my next question, which is, um, so the context of storytelling, whether it's a written word or a um, visual storytelling or a movie, it all depends on our experiences, our real life experience. How do you feel like the current political climate, um, the pandemic or any other, I don't know what else is going on now, the the Black Lives Matter move, how is that in, in form and shaped the stories that you're telling now? Well, I mean, Box of Bones is all about now. Um, it's all about, it's all about uh, black pain and um, the unacknowledged suffering of black people in this country. Um, I don't think we would, I mean, we started this, uh, damn, we started this five, six years ago. I'm like, feels like I'm longer, sure. but yeah. around that time. I don't think the country would have been ready for, I, I think, I mean, of course, black people would have been ready for this whenever, but I don't think the country would have been ready for this story um, until everything that's going on now. And I, I don't wanna just call out George Floyd because I don't think it was just George Floyd. Like I, I tripped out a little bit when George Floyd died, not because another black man was killed because I was like, why is everybody paying attention to this? Mm -hmm. Like, did you not pay attention to the 12 year old that got shot? Did you right. not pay attention to the black woman who got pulled out of her car for no damn reason and died in jail for mysterious um, circumstances? Did right. you not pay attention to the brother who was arrested on camera, beat on camera, thrown into a police van, and then came out and somehow had a broken back and was laying in a uh, like in a uh, station for three days? Like, what? Like, what? Like, not not that George Floyd's death doesn't matter, but I'm like, why is it this? Right. And when somebody said, a white person said this to me, I was like, oh, that's stunning insight for a white person. They were like, because of COVID. They were like, because we were all home and we couldn't look away. Mm. Because we couldn't like ignore it because we couldn't not pay attention to it. Now we, we had to look at it and we had to say, oh, you know, it wasn't like there was crack sprinkled around him. It wasn't like he was selling Lucy's on the street. It wasn't like, you know, he looks a bit like, you know, to watch that video, they were like, uh, I, I think there's something wrong in America now, right? Mm -hmm. Like it was like, so, I'm like so I think it was a combination of COVID and George Floyd, like all of that, like now has folks open to the place where they can say, well, what, do, like, what does black horror, what is the horror of being black in America really look like? And John and Stacy and you, AB, and a whole bunch of other people have given that visual form for folks so they can finally have, have a visual indication of what that looks like and it's uncomfortable, you know? So it's like, cool, well, once, once we can look at it, then we can dissect it, then we can figure out what yeah. comes next. But we gotta look at it, we have to, we're a visual culture, we have to see it. Right, yeah, that's, um, yeah, go ahead, Bill. Oh, okay, um, 
One, um, before I answer this, I think the thing that even though I have I haven't actually watched the George Floyd video, but I think the one thing that really did it was how casual it was. Yep. He was casually killed for a very long time. And I think that is like the one thing that really, aside from the COVID and everybody's watching, like that's the one thing that we like just haven't seen yet. Like just how easy it is, right? Like he's on him for like eight minutes with his hands in his pockets. Like might as well be singing zippity doo dah while like a person's dying. And I think like that, that cognitive break that that brought about like the historical narratives of what police do and then the way that we read it, like it just like, it just snapped. And also we were ready to snap because, you know, pandemic, <laughs> but it was just, it was just that, like, it was just so casual. Like, yeah, just killing a black guy, nothing to see here. Um, but to, get, but to um, get to your question about, I always believe that um, you can't really write about what's going on at the current moment. Like if you are, it's a happy accident um, because we're not going to understand what's happening now for another five, 10, 20 years. Um, and I recently did this panel about comics and conflict and about history. And they're like, well, are, are you writing anything about the current moment? And I said, oddly enough, I think that the thing that I wrote last year, the day the Klan came to town, right. is like literally about right now. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. You know, and that was 1923 that I was writing about. Mm -hmm. But if you read it, you're like, oh, that could literally because there are white people fighting neo Nazis in the street like right this second, right, right. Um, so I, I don't even necessarily think it's important, other than like our project APB, which was all about right this second, right. Um, to really feel the need to talk about what's happening now because we're not gonna get it for, I mean, a hot take on what's happening now is just gonna look silly, mm -hmm. like five years from now. You know, um, when we dropped um, I Am Alfonso Jones, that was in 20, 2017. And I remember for the 13 months like we were working on that book, I actually kind of hoped I had this really ideal dream that police brutality would stop at least while I was working on the book. And, and that's something, that's, that's a really interesting story. You know, that's a story to draw right there, you know. I'd forever be drawn, like to keep that at bay if that, if that were, you know, um, something that could take place. But when the book came out, I remember as, we, as I was drawing the book, I didn't have time to mourn the people who were dying in the hands of the, of, of the police because I had to I had to recognize it and keep drawing the book because the book was so important. And this year, it, it's like that book is more, it felt like this in the past several months, I Am Alfonso Jones is more and more popular now than it was when it first came out. Um, so many people were talking about it. I don't know how many lectures I, I did about it, classroom visits, et cetera. So many people, um, have been talking about it, like, but it came out three years ago, you know, and, and as, as foolish as that dream was that police brutality would stop, like, like people would read the book, police would read the book, and they were like, I can't believe what we're doing, we're going to stop doing this. But it was a dream, you know, um, and not to be too lighthearted, but I actually had, had this hope that my art would, would, would change that you know, would actually end police brutality. Um, I don't know if I took that off topic or not, but I, I just felt like it just felt so, like like doing that three years ago and it feels like it's more relevant now than it was three years ago, which is, is I can't, it's hard to even imagine that, you know, but anyway. No, no that was perfect. No, it actually, oddly, I feel like I went in a different direction personally with my work becoming more, uh, at least with zines, um, becoming more personal and more direct. Uh, because before, like two years ago, I did work that was talking about subjects outside of myself. All those were, were always drawing ourselves and talking about ourselves ultimately, 
but I started making purzines that spoke directly to my own feelings that were directly speaking to these issues. And I felt like last year and this year, I wanted to do more of that, which is way out of my comfort zone. So it will be interesting to see what happens in two and three years, um, especially for my own work. So do you, I know you have projects probably booked until uh, next year and beyond, but do you feel like your personal voice becomes more emboldened, which is what I feel by, by current events? Or do you go the opposite way and, and just let it, um, let it play out Coontown, however it will? Yeah, I wrote Coontown Killing Caper. I don't, I don't, um, I generally don't, don't hold anything back really. So right. yeah, I mean, it'd just be, I probably, I'm probably more relaxed now because <laughs> I don't feel like you're screaming as much, right. you know, like people are finally listening. I just started <laughs> screaming, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Scream away. I mean, it's nice. <laughs> I'm just saying. And that kind of go ahead. I'm sorry. I think a I think any art requires a level of bravery, mm. um, and that what that bravery looks like. And you know, I'm I'm all for screaming, um, but I think it's the bravery of putting um, a valuable piece of yourself out there, um, and yeah. put and having it be exposed to the world. And I think the more that you risk that, the more we're, you're, 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 you're in the vein of actually connecting with people. I think there's so much um, just falsity, like just like, you know, reprehensible kind of like false speak and just like pablum going on on all different levels. People come to art as a way of having like real conversation, like real mm -hmm. talk right to be moved to be shifted to be changed in some way right. and so if you if you give that hopefully and an, 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 you'll find an audience that will connect with that you may not but the bravery is in the artist to continue to put that out there in whatever form they can again and again and again be it comics be it novels be it you know still it like whatever and to say you know here's a part of me here's a part of me here's a part of me you know i I don't, I'm not interested in coward artists, right? I'm not interested in artists that like are great technically, but aren't saying anything or aren't sharing anything. I'm just, I'm, not, I'm just not interested. Right. I totally yeah. I, no, go ahead, John. I'm sorry. No, not at all. I, you know, I, um, uh, so just really quickly, uh, Amy. Yeah, I agree with, to a certain degree, what both of them say. <laughs> because yeah, I mean, I, I do feel that we're not having to scream as much. But I also feel like at 50 years old, I just turned 50. Um, and with this little boy that I have to like protect and raise, that I don't have time to miss words. And I, don't, I just don't, I never really did anyway, but now I really don't. So it's like, yeah, um, I think that the type of story is gonna shift according to whatever you're trying to do. But, you know, you try to make it as, as clear and as powerful and as meaningful as possible while you're here, because as, this particular, as this year has shown us, nothing is promised. After, after losing, I lost my sister this, this summer, you know, to a sudden heart attack, she was 59 years old, right? Still dealing with it. And I'm like, you know, really, you really don't know. <laughs> you, know you, don't, you don't know how this stuff, so you might as well say what's on your mind and get off your chest now, you know? Right, right. Wait, you had Stacey? Um, you you kind of said it, I was gonna say at 48, I don't really have the, the time to not say what's on my mind um, and, and to not be bold saying that. Uh, but the other thing is, um, our people need it. And I feel like, I, I feel like when you have the vision, like we're always looking for, for John the Baptist, <laughs> you know, we're always looking for, well, who's the, ne who's the Malcolm and the Martin of our generation? Where are our black leaders at? Well, if you feel like you have, if you see the vision, you see the need, then you're probably the one that's being called, yeah. you know, and I feel like, I feel like we're looking for, you know, we're looking for like this, this magic spark in a particular way or the, the clouds to open up or something. But when I look at who's the Martin and the Malcolm of our generation, well, how many people did they inspire? 
How many people did Baldwin inspire, right? They, they, they made a bunch of babies in us, right? In our generation. Yeah. We owe it to our ancestors, but we owe it to our people to speak in ways that only we can. And it hit me this year that like when, when, when the summer was really heating up, it hit me that I realized I was not scared to die. And it also hit me that in a particular way, my favorite thing in the world is being a father, but I regretted bringing children into this world, right? Or contributing to that, my ex-wife carried them, right? But I regretted doing that because then I felt like I was touchable and I couldn't be as outspoken as I might really imagine myself being if I were, if, if my children could, be, could not be touched. Does that make sense? Mm. You know? Um, so I feel like in a particular way, yeah, 48, just like as John said, and then with John's side, I feel like I have a, you know, I feel, I feel like I, I have to live for, for Jackson. You know, I have to be successful for Jackson and, and for his generation. You know, there, there's a lot that I think that, you know, are in this particular moment that we're all trying to really grasp grapple with trying to understand we're trying to find our own footing in this all of us as really um you know awakened artists right or awakened creators but at the same time we're also as we're finding ourselves and finding our place in this movement we're also trying to inspire then you know the the people who don't have that voice right yeah and and it's, sometimes that's really hard to articulate and it's stressful you know, um, man, I, I, I know I just real I need therapy. I'm not even gonna front. Like for real. <laughs> well art <laughs> like, is is therapy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It definitely is. That's I think that's the only way I survived this, in all honesty. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and then some more on top of that. Need some more therapy on top of that. You know? Yeah, no, seriously. Yeah, yeah seriously. It's, it's yeah. Uh, this is um this is one for the history books for real, for real. You know, it's yeah. It's been wild out here on these streets. <laughs> <laughs> so, anybody have questions for the panel? I mean, We're gonna be wrapping up, uh, YouTubers. We did have one comment in the chat earlier. Uh, Nisbet says storytelling is often spent building up the world of the plot with stories now that are dealing with current events. There isn't a need for world biz world building because we are living it. <laughs> res res I respectfully <laughs> disagree. Um, and the only reason I say that is, um, you know, I teach as well and teaching some stuff from um, Harlem Renaissance, and the assumptions made in the 19, 20, you know, twenties, thirties, forties about what black life was like. It's really hard to go back and read some of those stories. And I'm, cause I'm like, oh, we don't, we don't get down like that anymore. <laughs> it was like, they had to go, he had to, like they had to walk past 125th to pick up a cab. I'm like, why you gotta walk past 125th? Mm -hmm. Oh, cause they had the white cabs of the black cabs, the, right? But they don't explain that. They don't explain that in the narrative. And one of the great things about, it's called mimesis. It's, it's a way of, of representing the world in literature. One of the great things about it is that it forces the writer to analyze what they consider to be the norm. And I think that's one of the, that's one of the therapeutic aspects and one of the beautiful artistic aspects of, of writing, of any creating, is how do you break down the world? Like for John and for um, Stacy, like, you know, if they're, if they're doing a, like a, a four, cor uh, four cornered room, right? And it's like, and the, let's say a writer's like, you know, the room is cream colored. Well, what is cream? What color is cream? That decision, how they make that, right? That matters. So we are building worlds. By telling our worlds, we are defining our worlds and we're building our worlds. So we are world building. Black Lives Matter is world building, right? Like, just say no, like, you know, that, that's, that's world building. Like, you know, um, all of the movements that are going on now, they're creating worlds in, in the now. And I think, I think it's important to, to name those, define those and, and to, to, to uplift them as, as world building. All right, and then the last question, 
what would be the ultimate form you would want your work to take? Would you want your work to be a movie someday? I mean, I, I think that when we make it, it's in its ultimate form to a certain degree. I mean, it, but uh, it would be great for it to be adapted in other things. But, you know, you have to understand, like, when you adapt something to a different medium, you do change the story. I mean, that's it's adapting from one form to the other. So it's going to shift the narrative because each medium has different affordances and tells stories differently. But as far as, like, you know, uh, the ultimate form, I think that's the thing that we're working on. You know, because, you know, if you are an artist working in a particular medium, then you're trying to, to work with the constraints and, um, like I said, affordances of a medium. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, getting, you know, getting something picked up as an animation or as a film or what have you would be awesome. You know, it's because I have a, have a toddler. Did I mention that? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, but, but, but still, though, I mean, we made it a comic and, you know, I think it's a great comic. I mean, I it's messed too. up, but it's like, you know, <laughs> but it's, uh, it functions really well as a comic, so. Anybody else want to tackle that? Um, um, no, go ahead, Bill. No, go ahead. Oh, uh, I was just going to say, I mean, for me personally, it, it's like the story, <clears throat> I mean, the story that you put down, like for me, like there's some things I visualized as comics and there's some things I visualized as novels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's sort of like, to me, the ultimate form, like whatever it is that you write down, like that's sort of my statement. Like for me as a writer, the ultimate statement is the novel because that's me against the world. That's my Tupac, right? <laughs> and then like, <laughs> if you're doing a comic, right, then it's more of a collaborative thing. Like you say something and, you know, then you kind of, you know, hash it out to, what that looks like. And in a lot of ways uh, that, I mean, it's more of the, the artist medium than it is the writers. Um, and then, you know, if you're talking like movies and all that other stuff, I mean, that's no longer my statement. Like that's somebody else's statement on like an idea that I came up with. So for me, the ultimate work is, you know, whatever it is that I put down in my own words, but probably the novel would be for me because that's where you have the most control as a writer. Right. I was thinking about the the ultimate form. You know, um, I, I really don't, I'm not even sure what that means. I will say that I'm always trying to figure out new ways of connecting to my connecting to my audience. And like I said, as an emerging DJ, one of the things that I always want to be able to do with my art shows is create. The, the sonics of the space, because the sonics of the space will help to converse the visual art um, and vice versa. And there, are, I know there are things that I can do, you know, with, with and I, I'm, I think I'm still, as I'm learning how to DJ, I'm chasing this imaginary set that is like the ultimate, um, the ultimate experience where all of these sensual um, elements kind of converge and create this perfect moment. Um, and for me, I think that in a particular way is like the ultimate, um, that would be the ultimate and, and whether I'm creating a storytelling or creating that particular moment, um, that is a particular thing that I'm chasing. In reference to the medium itself though, I think that you can make a really, really dope story. I could draw the hell out of it, et cetera. But if, if, it, it is not legible to my reader or to my audience than in a particular way I failed, you know? So I feel like I'm always, I'm chasing this particular thing that I'm trying to understand myself. And yes, awesome. of course, I would love for my, my stuff to be a movie, you know, be made into a new, more popular media form, especially if it can go into the, the future and my, my descendants can um, capitalize on my IPs. I think that's just smart business, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh man, this has been so awesome. Our time is up. Thank you so much. I appreciate each and one of you. Um, you guys are mentoring me in ways that you don't even know. I appreciate you being so generous and taking the time always to talk to me and uh, give me great jewels and, and uh, seeds of knowledge. And I really, really appreciate you taking the time to be on this panel and sharing with uh, everybody. 
uh, just want to say thank you to the volunteers and everybody's helping with the moderation. Uh, and uh, look forward to meeting again on Wednesday with the featured artist, uh, Shani Ely. I'll be interviewing her. And then uh, the main expo will be Saturday, December 5th, and where we will uh, have tablers and exhibitors sharing their zines and comics. And again, thank you so much tonight for joining us. Uh, man, I'm so grateful to you guys. Any last things you guys want to shout out your websites? Oh. Uh, I guess I'm the publisher, right? Uh, there you go. <laughs> Go to rosariumpublishing.com. That's R-O-S-A-R-I-U-M publishing.com. Uh, you can pre-order Box of Bones right now if you want to at the Rosarium store. There you go. Awesome. Sweet. <laughs> thank you, guys. Have thank a good night. You, too. Thank, you, too. Uh, you too. thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone. All, All right. right. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye.